So good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to this webinar titled Roadmap to 3 Billion Gallons of SAF by 2030. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Harry. I'm the conference producer at Sustainable Aviation Futures, a global series of high-level aviation decarbonization events focusing on the upscale and sustainable solutions for the aviation industry to reach net zero by 2050. This hour-long webinar looks to discuss how the North America aviation industry can meet the target for 3 billion gallons of SAF, with a particular focus on North America policy, technology capabilities, different feedstocks, and the need to adapt infrastructure in the region. This webinar is being hosted in advance of Sustainable Aviation Futures Congress North America, taking place in Houston from the 2nd to the 4th of October. The three-day event will feature over 450 attendees and 120 speakers to deep dive into the exciting potential being experienced in the North American market and across the globe. Today, we'll provide a snapshot into the topics covered at the event with an opportunity to hear from the speakers today, as well as many more. This, uh, this week is the last week you are able to purchase the three for two deals to attend the event, meaning you get one pass completely free. For more details, they'll be included at the end. Before I hand over to today's moderator, a couple of bits of housekeeping. This session is being recorded and will be distributed to you once the webinar finishes. Furthermore, there is an ongoing Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, so please do ask any questions, and today's moderator, Jade Patterson, will do his best to ask the, audience, uh, to ask the moderators at the end. With that, I'm very pleased to welcome today's expert speakers. Tony Long, who is President and CTO of Agra Energy, Amina Daman, Partner of Environmental Health and Safety at King & Spalding, Mark Schmohan, Technology Manager at the US Department of Energy, and Hartej Singh, who's Manager of Climate Aligned Industries at the Rocky Mountain Institute. And now I'll head over to today's moderator, Jade Patterson. Jade is a Senior Associate in Renewable Fuels and is part of Bloomberg NEF's Natural Gas Research Team and leader in the Clean Fuel Research. With that, I'll hand over to Jade and thank you very much. Well, thank you, Harry, and uh, hello, everyone. It's great to be here with you all, and, and thank you for joining us. Uh, over the next hour, uh, our discussion will focus on everything from policy to technology and infrastructure that can enable SAF adoption. Please do, as, as Harry mentioned, ask your questions in the chat along the way. It's our goal to, to make this uh, fun and engaging uh, and as beneficial as possible to, to you all. Uh, before we dive into our conversation and, and questions, uh, first, let's uh, let's get to know our panelists a little bit more. Uh, Hartig, I'll, I'll kick it over to you first to share a little bit about yourself and, and RMI. Sure. Thank you. I really appreciate it, Jade. My name is Hartej. Uh, I'm a manager at RMI's Climate Aligned Industries, leading our supply side practice uh, under the aviation team. Uh, fundamentally, we are trying to catalyze supply. So we're working with uh, the largest producers at various stages of development uh, across the U.S., um, helping them get certainty around their, their carbon intensity analysis, uh, how many uh, incentives, how much incentives are going to get at the federal and state level, uh, and and more. Um, so really, really excited to be part of this conversation, and I think it's going to go a long way to um, educating the industry. Thank you, Hartej. Uh, Mina, over to you. Thank you. So good morning, good afternoon. My name is Amina Daman. I'm a partner at the international law firm of King and Spalding. I'm an environmental lawyer and I'm located in Austin, Texas. One area that I focus on in my practice are renewable fuels, and in particular, how the renewable fuels are regulated by the EPA here in the United States to so the renewable um, you know, fuels program. And as most of you know, SAF, Sustainable Aviation Fuel, which is the topic of our discussion today, is also one of the fuels that can participate in that program. So I'm very excited to be here today and look forward to our discussion. Thanks, Amina. Tony, over to you. Hi, I'm Tony Long. Um, I am one of the founders of AgroEnergy. We are at um, uh, the stage of having our first commercial system come online here shortly. Um, and when I say shortly, within the next two weeks, um, our facility takes uh, dairy-based uh, uh, biogas and converts it into diesel and to SAF. Uh, that's uh, the reason why we wanted to participate today. I look forward to the discussion and I thank you all for attending. Thanks, Tony. Excited to learn more about that project. And uh, Mark, uh, last but not least, over to you. I think you need to unmute. 
does. Yeah. Sorry about that. We don't use Zoom that much at DOE. Uh, Mark Schmora, Department of Energy in the Bioenergy Technologies Office. Our office focuses on risk reduction for developing technology pathways for the conversion of renewable biomass and other materials to products and fuels. So I'm happy to be here today. Right. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so the, the first, my first question, uh, I'd like to start off with you, Hartej, um, with, with your focus on understanding incentives and, and carbon intensity. Um, but we'd like to kind of take a, a broader step view and, you know, looking at, you know, the, the Inflation Reduction Act. So we're, we're one year into the passage of the, of the IRA. Um, what does uh, North America's sustainable aviation fuel landscape look like today? Thank you, Jade. It's a, it's a really, really interesting question. Um, I think we have a lot more certainty on the producer side that there is indeed going to be a market for sustainable aviation fuel. Not that that was any doubt pre-IRA, uh, but you know, there's there was an inherent competition between renewable diesel and SAF, for example, and the IRA helped provide some certainty around the economics for SAF in particular. Um, so now producers feel a bit more empowered uh, to configure their plants and their operations and their business models around SAF as a key product. Um, so not only in the U.S. is, is the market stronger, but uh, other geographies are following suit in the EU, for example, and in Asia Pacific. Um, so I, I would say we're, we're in a vastly better place now post IRA uh, one year later. That's great. Um, Amina, do you have any comments on, on what you're seeing in, in terms of the overall SAF landscape uh, across, across the North America region? Yeah, sure. So um, as, as Hartej mentioned, um, we're seeing a lot of investment into new renewable fuel production plants, and in particular also plants you know, that will be capable of producing SAF. There's a lot of activity here in Texas you know, where I'm located. And I think what we're waiting for now is sort of to see the fruits of that activity, to really see then the um, production volume of SAF go up. I mean, if you read the news, you know, you see there are certified volumes of SAF being produced domestically and also internationally. But, you know, that just the amount of volume needs to be increased significantly if we really want to hit the three billion gallon target by 2030 that the government has put out. Um, so there are certainly some, some challenges, which I'm sure we'll discuss today some more. I mean, there are challenges related to feedstock availability. There are challenges related to scaling production and having a you know, smooth process to actually get um, production facilities go online. Um, there's also a challenge with ensuring compliance as the regulatory landscape is changing. So just you know, recently, EPA enacted a new rule. The RFS program by itself is, is not new, but you know, there's new rules that are being enacted. Interpretation of existing rules can change. So just for, for the participants in a market to adjust to this changing regulatory landscape can be a challenge. And then also there's going to be new players right, in this, in this market. And if you look down the supply chain, there's going to be less sophisticated companies being involved. So, Putting all that together and, and having a compliance system in, in place can be costly and, and time um, intensive. So that's just uh, another challenge that we're seeing. And then uh, finally, but just maybe as a final remark, you know, what's sort of the more long-term um, policy perspective? And we have the IIA that will, you know, go through 2027. But you know, what what after that? Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. And you know. We've talked a little bit about the Inflation Reduction Act and the you know the, the SAF tax credit there, um, but there's also existing biofuel credits uh, from from the Rural Fuel Standard as well as other other state policies. So um, you know what what specific roles do you think um, you know the states are can can play in sustainable aviation fuel adoption? Um, you know, is this kind of a, a California story like renewable diesel, um, or are other states kind of stepping up? Uh, would love to hear thoughts around that. Maybe, Mark, do you have any any comments around the state level policies you'd like to share? No, I do not. Sorry, I'm not. <laughs> no, no worries. I, apologies. <laughs> All good. Um, yeah, if, if there's nothing on the state level, um, you know, maybe we can. I'm, I'm happy um, to, to chime in. I mean, there's, yeah, um, there's of course, the actual like state programs. So I, I know Oregon and, and Washington State, they have their own programs. And what's important to know that you can stack or you can stack up your credits. So even if you have federal credits and you also participate in, in state programs, 
they're not mutually exclusive. And the same is true, for example, for wind generation on the EPA's program, you know, tax credits you can get under the IA and then, you know, potential state programs. So you can you can stack them all up, which which is great. And then just another aspect to it is in addition to just um, credits or, you know, grant money or RINs, you know, certain states really try to attract business. So, you know, I can speak for Texas where you just see a lot of activity with new plants being constructed. So, you know, you will want to have sort of an and an overall in infrastructure with little like local opposition, just like a supportive system um, for for the new production of the plants, and then and then the product and all the infrastructure that comes along with it. And, and Jade, I'll add one more piece to that. Uh, beyond California, Oregon, and Washington, we are seeing other states, as Amina mentioned, uh, sort of following suit. Uh, we're seeing that in Illinois as well, where there is a uh, SAF incentive at the state level. Uh, and we expect to continue to see that uh, throughout other states as well, um, whether it's on the East Coast, in the Midwest, or in the South as well. Yeah, it's great to see other states kind of pop up. T Tony, I see you have uh, something to add there. Yeah, I was just going to add, um, being on the producer side, uh, the multiple jurisdiction uh, green incentive uh, is, is important, um, especially trying to bring on new technologies because there's a there's a fair amount of risk in those technologies. There's a lot of upfront costs to develop them, and so uh, while I know those will eventually start to 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 uh, peter out over time, that's the goal. Uh, having them in place today with multiple jurisdictions is uh, really important uh, to to bringing new technologies online. Right, um, and let's kind of move back, uh, switching from states to zooming back out to kind of the federal level. So. You know, one of the biggest developments of, of this past uh, this past year for for biofuels in general was the the EPA's set rule, which was finalized in June. Um, you know, the rule kind of largely undercut the uh, the required amount of renewable diesel compared to where the industry is going in terms of announced capacities. Um, so, you know, th this could potentially provide an opportunity for for SAF um, because they're they're produced alongside one another. Um, and so we'd just love to kind of hear, um, you know, your thoughts on the impacts of this uh, EPA legislation and, uh, you know, what impacts you think this could have on, on SAF. Uh, and, you know, maybe we'll, we'll start off with you if you have any thoughts around uh, the EPA ruling. Sure. Um, so if you read the, the preamble to the new rule where, where EPA sort of discusses it, it's thinking, what's, what's interesting, I mean, they do acknowledge um, that there are the tax credits, you know, through the IIA and that SAF production volumes may increase as a result of that. However, they um, looked at the production volumes from past years for SAF, and they were still you know, fairly low. And then EPA also looked at where is the SAF being produced currently. And I guess what they're observing is that it's really the renewable diesel production facilities that, that are also you know, producing the, the SAF. So the thinking is, it, it's not that the overall you know, volume is increasing, but it's the renewable diesel volume going down and then the SAF volume going up with the net change being, you know, small to, to none. Um, whether that assumption is true, I, I don't know, I'm not the one to judge that, but that's the criticism, I guess, that you're hearing. It would be great to hear from Tony later on whether he has a view on that. But then, of course, other criticism is, um, you know, what can we do to make it easier to introduce new feedstock types into the program, you know, how can we make it easier and faster to approve, um, you know, the pathway petitions? You can look at the website. That's you know quite a list of, of pending pathways petitions. Not all of them relate to, to jet fuel, but you know th that will be interesting. How can we move that through? And then I guess another criticism that you hear again um, comparing the renewable diesel to the SAF, how many rents do you actually get for the gallon? So right now I understand that for re renewable diesel you typically get 1.7 rents. Um, per gallon, while for the jet fuel, it's, it's a little bit lower, 1.6, you know, and the 0 0.1 difference may be small, but if you scale it up, you know, there is uh, arguably a financial incentive to go with a renewable diesel production where you get a higher in number compared to the to the SAF generation. Yeah, you bring up a good point there on, um, yeah, that there is a slight difference in, in kind of the energy intensity of of the the fuels for for renewable diesel versus versus SAF and um, leading to somewhat less of a uh, slightly less incentives on the on the fuel side. Um, but yeah, Tony, I think we're going to move on to technology. So I think maybe that's a kind of a good segue um, if you want to kind of dive in and talk a little bit about um, your production 
your project that is uh, slated to come online here shortly. Um, and we'd love to hear about the kind of the yield differential between renewable diesel and SAF and, and what your ability is to tweak that maybe in, in your process specifically. Well, um, and just to, to kind of follow up on the on the RINs, yes, obviously, the, since the molecules uh, have less energy in them on the, the lower end of the carbon chain, um, it, it does impact the, the BTUs per gallon uh, and therefore the, the amount of RINs you get. Um, that said, a uh, process like ours, uh, we get a spectrum of molecules that we have to distill anyway. So we get about 50% uh, in the diesel range for a number two diesel and then 50% in the um, SAF range. So um, we'll end up producing both uh, just, just by virtue of our process. We can slightly skew that uh, with, with process um, pressure, temperature, but, um, but generally speaking, we, we get a distribution of molecules um, that's you know, basically a C22 and down. Um, for those who are, are, are more um, interested in, in the actual fuel details. Um, and, and so, you know, the fact that we can get RINs on both is, is critical. Um, and, you know, the sourcing that we're doing from biogas, um, you know, makes them cellulosic. So um, that, that obviously is helpful within, within the space of, of, of RFS. Um, it, it uh, you know, gives us a, a bonus uh, on the number of RINs per gallon. Um, and, and, you know, as far as uh, yield goes, uh, you know, we're, we're in a situation where, you know, if, if we can, and I'll just speak to dairy cows, but obviously uh, it's applicable to hogs. Um, I hope one day it'll also be applicable to poultry and to feedlots. Um, you know, uh, it's uh, applicable to, to landfills, um, water, wastewater treatment. So pretty much anywhere that you can get uh, waste uh, methane, um, you know, uh, is, is what we're kind of targeting. Um, but for in equivalent to dairy cows for 10,000 dairy cows, um, I can get you about 700,000 gallons a year of SAF and 700,000 gallons of diesel. Um, you know, if, uh, if you just kind of, you know, look at that and, and, you know, if you had about a third of the dairy cows in the nation, um, and you were using their manure, we'd be at 700 million gallons of each a year. So, you know, that's, um, it, it, it's very possible to use these waste streams um, and, and get something out of them. And, um, you know, for us, the, the key is um, drop in fuels that go in existing infrastructure. And, and also um, we don't use food stocks, we use waste streams. Yeah, and kind of a follow-up question on that, Tony, and, and maybe you touched on it a little bit, but, um, are you able to kind of, it sounds like you have around a 50-50 yield between um, RD and, and SAF. Is that something that you guys are able to tweak with your current system? Or is that something you could do if you added added some more equipment on? Or what's that? Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, like us we're using a Fisher Trope space system, um, which uh, has been around a long time. I mean, there's, there's lots of people out there who understand those kinds of systems. Um, we are able to, to push our distribution a little bit. Um, but uh, um, I, at most, I'd be able to do maybe 60, 40 SAF being the 60 and 40 on the diesel. Um, but it's it just just by nature of of the system we have, we will we will produce both. That's super interesting. Um, yeah, and I think kind of want to take a step back and, and question for you, Mark, if you can kind of, mm -hmm. you know, maybe give us sort of a broader overview. You know, we know SAF is expensive. Uh, it costs more to make than than conventional jet fuel. It's cleaner. Um, but, you know, how do you think North America, you know, can increase investment in aviation, um, you know, and, and kind of accelerate reaching maybe cost parity, and if not cost parity, at least lower the cost of producing SAF. So how can we, how can we yeah. accelerate the cost reductions over time? Yeah, yeah, there's no question the cost is at least double and sometimes up to 10x. And, you know, uh, I've been in in biorefinery technology since 2005. And the mantra a decade ago was we need cost parity and we've given up um, you know, on that. We don't talk about that anymore. So stacking all these credits is essential to pencil out the financials for a project. But nonetheless, um, policy will be essential to support these things. And we need to demonstrate these technologies. So DOE, you know, is somewhat technology pathway agnostic. We're very interested in scaling, you know, multiple pathways and demonstrating them. 
So what we see is a key step, and it's not just the process technology. This would apply to you know, developing feedstock supply chains as well, is that you need to demonstrate them at a pre-commercial scale to reduce the risk associated with that technology. Um, and this is where federal funding comes to play. We can be an equity participant on these projects, um, help demonstrate them, get them up and running, demonstrate 1,000 hours or 2,000 hours or 6,000 hours of continuous production. So you reduce the technology risk and, and make them attractive for, you know, on the commercial scale. So we see that as, as an important an important strategy is getting these plants stood up, getting process technologies, getting feedstock technologies uh, stood up, demonstrated at scale and reducing their risk. Yeah, th thank you for that. Yeah, I, I think you bring up a good point on, yeah, having to kind of prove these technologies in, in mm -hmm. demonstration to bring them to com commercialization. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on kind of what you're seeing in terms of technologies being explored, either commercialized or maybe even an early kind of demonstration pilot scale um, that could be game changing yeah. to SAP production. Yeah, so we're seeing a lot, obviously. So alcohol to jet, the catalytic upgrading of alcohol to higher weight, you know, oligomers and olefins is a technology that is on the cusp of commercial demonstration. And we have numerous projects in our pipeline and that are out there and running. Um, gas to liquids, and there are numerous technology pathways for the conversion of renewable natural gas or waste gases. Um, perhaps those are lower TRL, but certainly the conversion of renewable natural gas or uh, whether it be landfill gas or gas from anaerobic digestion. Yes, those pathways are being scaled and demonstrated. Uh, Tony is a great example of that. And then the other, the other pathway that I think we're going to start hearing more about is hydrothermal liquefaction of waste solids from you know, uh, wastewater treatment facilities. That technology is on the cusp of being demonstrated at scale. Um, so that's kind of what we're seeing today. I, I hope, I don't, I don't mean to offend anybody if I've left anything out, but I would say that in terms of the DOE portfolio, um, this is what we're aware of today. And these are the kind of projects that we're collaborating in today. So by no means, I hope I haven't missed anybody. <laughs> <laughs> And and Mark, just because I know I want to drill down on this a little bit yeah. more and, and hear other thoughts yeah. as well. Um, uh -huh. and you kind of you kind of mentioned, you know, using waste sources RNG yep. and, and and other like wastewater, which mm -hmm. is being used for, for a lot of times road fuel consumption today and, and maybe heat. Uh -huh. So, you know, how do you how do you think about how to most efficiently use that waste? Do you think SAF is is kind of the best option for that? Or, you know, should we reserve it for other hard to debate sectors? Um, you know, is there sort of any any trade-offs there or, or any thoughts around how, how to best leverage this kind of limited resource? Because we know there's not a lot of biogas and a lot of cows out there. Um, in yeah, other ways. but there are, there are lots of sources of, of uh, renewable waste from uh, wastewater treatment sludge to municipal solid waste. Um, and so there are certainly pathways to upgrade this to products or fuel. So products being chemicals or polymers or fuel is certainly, in our opinion, a much more strategic approach than burning them to generate power or electricity. Not that that's that not not every solution works everywhere, but there are lots of renewable sources. And I think it's fair to say we're scratching the surface on waste CO2 and the various pathways to upgrade CO2 and waste flue gases. Those technologies are maybe longer term, but they are certainly, um, we're making you know, the Department of Energy, not my program office, but DOE is investing massively in the conversion of waste gases to uh, fuels or chemicals, et cetera. Yeah, if I, if, if I could perhaps just add a little bit there. Um, yeah, our process, uh, just by virtue of, of our starting gases, we, we end up converting about 25% of the CO2 uh, into, into usable gases for Fisher Trope. 
Um, right. That probably doesn't surprise you at all, Mark. Um, right. But we, we are also looking at some, some newer catalysts that are in our R&D pipeline that would potentially bring that up to uh, about 80% consumption of the CO2 along with the methane being consumed. Um, so I think there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of exciting technologies that are, that are kind of just around the corner that can be applied. Um, and, and that particular catalyst would, would yield more in the, um, in the gasoline and, and uh, uh, SAF range and, and would not yield in the diesel range. Yeah. And, and Jade, I think it's also fair to point out, I, I don't want to um, forget, we have massive refinery infrastructure in North America, and there, there is a lot of focus on, on generating feedstocks that are appropriate for refinery conversion and upgrading. And there are obviously massive advantages to leveraging that infrastructure, um, which can you know, easily move fuels to airports or other facilities for fueling infrastructure. So um, lots of focus on pathways to produce feedstocks for the you know, existing refineries is underway as well. That's great. And, and I'm glad you kind of brought up feedstocks because that's kind of the next, mm -hmm. um, you know, tech, I guess, section we want to move into. And we've kind of touched on it a little bit, but, yeah. um, you know, just want to talk a little bit more about which feedstocks are available and scalable um, in North America. Any thoughts around that, um, either Mark or, or Hartej or, or anyone else want to, want to comment on the feedstock availability and, and, uh, and scalability of those feedstocks? Go for it, Mark. Uh, no, I mean, we have we have touched on it. So I think sources of renewable natural gas are very important. We have waste from wastewater treatment facilities, many of which are currently landfilled, which are being prohibited from going to landfill from wastewater treatment or, or just waste treatment, waste processing facilities that need to be diverted from landfill. Um, we're you know, well down the road of exploiting waste fats, oils, and greases as a feedstock to go into refineries. And we need to develop uh, sort of the next generation of feedstocks that are refinery compatible. Um, the, you know, we, we still struggle to convert um, uh, corn stover, which is a plentiful feedstock in this country. Um, but there are still projects that are working to demonstrate the conversion of stover, either through anaerobic digestion or straight up enzymatic routes, et cetera, to produce alcohols that can go to jet or sugars that can go to a number of products. So there are many. Um, and then there's a plethora of feedstocks that USDA and others have investigated that have the potential, but it's somewhat of a catch-22 until the market exists these feedstocks aren't, aren't going to be put into production. So it will take time. It will take time. So yeah, the, no. the only ahead. thing I'll add is, um, so, you know, regardless of your processing technology, you're going to need a lot of hydrogen as mm -hmm. a feedstock. So hydrogen is a, is a big part of the equation um, and the carbon intensity of that hydrogen is ultimately going to affect your finished product CI. So hydrogen yeah. is a huge part of the equation here. Um, and just going back to what Mark mentioned a few moments ago about CO2, we're just scratching the surface, uh, exploring how to commercialize CO2 as a feedstock, especially for SAF, um, you know, especially with the, the recent uh, regulations in the EU, um, you know, where they've taken a determination what's biogenic, what's renewable, what's not renewable uh, mm -hmm. when we talk about CO2 as a feedstock. I think biogenic CO2 in the North America market is going to be increasingly important, uh, and we're going to see that market evolve um, from a feedstock perspective. Um, and I think that's especially important given, you know, the existing CO2 infrastructure in the U.S. Gulf Coast, for example, um, and the developing CO2 infrastructure and in markets uh, in other parts of the country. Yeah, thanks for that. And I guess kind of um, continue on, on the feedstock discussion, you know, we we realize, right, there for certain pathways, there, there are limitations uh, here on in domestic supply, but um, wanted to get some some thoughts around, you know, potentially importing feedstocks. Um, you know, is that something we might see uh, in, in the near future? Or, you know, what's what's the possibility of, of that? Is there any restrictions around um, around what that could look like? I'm I'm happy to take to take that. 
Um, so maybe just as a baseline, as a background, under the IAA, under the IRA, for the in order to get the tax credit for the production that will you know kick in 2025, the production facility needs to be domestic, needs to be in the U.S. So the so what we're going to be talking about does not apply to production facilities that are outside the U.S. So you know the IRA tax credit will kick in for domestic production facilities. So the question now is, you know, how do we get the feedstock to the domestic production facilities? And I was very excited to hear from Mark, you know, about, you know, all the different uh, new sort of avenues that are being pursued and, and new technologies that people invest in. So that's that's great to hear. If we go back to the, you know, the, the feedstock that we're seeing a lot right now, I mean, Mark mentioned the, the waste, uh, fats, oils, greases, you know, where can we get all this animal fat, fish fat, and where can it all come from? And the domestic market for that is is going to be limited, right? So I, um, I, I see there will be, or I anticipate there will be import of these kind of feedstocks from globally, from from other parts of the world. Um, and and the challenge really that comes with how, how do you all um, regulate that process? Then I mean, obviously you want want to have traceability, um, and there are requirements at least for EPA's program, you know, where you have to be, you know, very clear and you know be able to show this is actually biomass. You know, there's a statement from the supplier that it is biomass. You'll want to have to show the the location where does it come from. You have the long, you know, transportation, so there could be different stops on the way. So I think one challenge as um, you know, feedstocks get imported, will be to, to juggle you know, the, the requirements and make sure that process is not just workable, it, you know, it's cost efficient, it's timely, but at the same time also compliant with the requirements here in the US. Yeah, thanks. Tony, do you want to add, add something on yeah, that? Yeah, I think uh, one thing I was going to add, and then obviously this is not imported, we're, we're domestic, but um, there are, there are tens of thousands of sources of, of biogas that's more common in. and many of them are quite small and and uh, you know so in, in our minds it's it's great to have a huge refinery everybody loves a huge refinery and you bring all the stuff to the refinery but we've kind of gone the other route and said why don't we figure out how to make the refinery cost effective closer to the source of the, of, mm -hmm. of the actual waste stream um, and and so that's that's really what we focused ourselves on uh, economy of scale of course is is very difficult to beat. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's where I think we have the opportunity to, to, to number one, actually, you know, take advantage of recently sequestered carbon energy, um, and use it rather than just see it go up into the air again. Um, and, and, and number two, you know, uh, bring more stability to, to our farming communities and, and also make it so that, um, you know, they're not seen as the source of pollution, but rather, uh, seen as a, uh, you know, uh, a source of, of solutions for, for us. Um, you know, so th those are, I, I mean, obviously we are going to import things, uh, you know, it's, it's a world economy, but I, um, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity here in North America for us to take advantage of, of waste streams that are, that are here. Um, they're maybe not too easy to get to because of their size, but, but, you know, I, I think that's going to make a big difference for us over the next 10 to 15 years. Agreed. Thank you. So, so yeah, Jade, I don't, you know, I, I think long term, I mean, clearly this country has demonstrated that capability of we have a we have a capacity of generating over a billion tons of renewable biomass and renewable feedstocks in this country. And that increases dramatically if we start thinking about waste CO2, waste gas sources in this country and the potential yield can easily satisfy the S SAF market long term in this country. So it's really it's really a matter of whether you import feedstocks, for example, if you have to import waste fats, oils, and greases to feed a refinery. I mean, I think it's a matter of timing as these feedstock supply chains mature and the technology pathways mature and these things come together down the road. But if you if you look at the billion ton study, that was done by DOE. It's being updated this year. We have we have we have vast sources of feedstock, renewable feedstock in this country to more than satisfy the aviation fuel demand in by 2050. So 2030 is a little different story in terms of maturity of technologies, maturity of feedstocks. Yeah. Oh yeah, th thanks for that. And um, I, I see kind of a flood of questions coming in. So so definitely keep keep those coming. Uh, super helpful and. While we're on the topic of feedstock, um, maybe shifting a little bit from the biogenic side to, to looking at 
um, you know, power to liquids, if that's if that's something we can kind of delve into here. Um, you know, there's some questions around, you know, taking carbon dioxide either from direct air capture or through biogenic sources or or, or even, you know, non-biogenic sources, uh, such as capturing it from a power plant that burns natural gas. Um, so curious if, if folks have thoughts, uh, this has been a question that's come up a few times in the chat around, you know, will non-biogenic CO2 be used as a feedstock for, for power to liquids? Is that something that we think is, is a good idea, something that, that can be that can be done um, and be preferred by airlines, or are they going to want to to use uh, biogenic sources, say from from ethanol production? Any thoughts around around that? Or... I'm happy to take a first swing at this. I mean, I think in industry we're seeing a you know we're we're in a global market, right? So while the U.S. might not have clear stipulations on on where on where the CO2 comes from, whether you use biogenic or non biogenic. The EU, the EU has taken a position on that, um, and they have basically said that post 2035, one can't use uh, non-biogenic CO2 or non-renewable CO2, I should say, uh, as a feedstock if you want to make SAF or, or power to liquids, right? So because we're in such a global market, that's influencing decision making here in the domestic North American market as well. Um, and, you know, the project developers, the producers are are thinking, you know, if I can't use uh, fossil CO2 as a feedstock post 2035, you know, why would I make that investment decision now? Um, it affects the payback period, right? Um, and these assets have quite a, quite a long payback period. So it is because we're in such a global market, uh, the decisions being made in the EU are affecting uh, decisions being made by domestic SAF producers here in the US as it pertains to fossil versus biogenic CO2. Thanks. Anyone else want to comment on the the, the power to liquids process or or CO two sourcing? Uh, if not, we can. Um, I'd like to kind of move on to a little bit more on the on the demand side and and what we're seeing from airlines as as well as a little bit on on infrastructure before we kind of get to to other questions in the chat. So. Um, you know, we've seen you know airlines face increasing scrutiny scrutiny over the the quality of of carbon offsets um, and you know, uh, how, so how do we think that that could, um, you know, in, incentivize or, or drive adoption for SAF? You know, I think when it comes to, to the airline industry, they, they don't have a lot of options, right? SAF is really um, kind of one, one of the main uh, options here. So, um, you know, any thoughts around, you know, what we're seeing from the, from the airline industry um, and, and how uh, SAF adoption could be, could be moving forward? I'm happy to kick us off on this one. Um, I think, you know, in the conversations RMI has had with the airline industry, we're seeing a move towards uh, prioritizing like quality and carbon intensity of the finished product over volumes. Um, so they're really scrutinizing the the LCA of that product that they're buying rather than just outright purchasing X million gallons of of product. Um, so I think the airline industry is recognizing they're they're getting smarter on on LCA, whether it's Corsia or Greet, um, and they're really scrutinizing the environmental attributes of that finished product. Um, so that's that's the only comment I'll make on that. Yeah, if I if I could add there, um, you know, certainly the the source of feedstock makes a big difference, and and um, you know, in the case of being able to use waste streams um, like uh, biogas from manure. Um, you know, the, the, the resultant um, offset that you get is not just gallon for gallon, um, but it's, it's multiple gallons per gallon because of the, the mitigated pollution. Um, and so, you know, I think that's, that's an important aspect, um, you know, that, that obviously shows up in things like LCFS in California, um, but also is, uh, I think, important for the airlines to keep in mind that it's not necessarily each gallon just to offset one gallon. Um, there's there's ways to have one gallon um, um, offset five or six gallons, um, and and so that that can be a big impact. And and um, and I would just comment um, that that is what you know happens when you when you come from a like a methane source like we have, um, and you know we're in a situation right now where we're about to produce it, and and we're we are still trying to secure an offtake partner. So I would just say if there's an airline out there that's interested, give us a call. 
<laughs> Love the plug out there, Tony. Um, and and yeah, I think, you know, kind of following along those lines, you know, we've talked a lot about the policy and, and you know, Mark brought up, you know, how, how we do need this policy to kind of uh, bridge that gap. So, um, you know, it, if policy is is unable to do that in all situations for all, all different feedstocks, um, you know, do you think, and, and maybe over certain timeframes, because policies come in and out, um, you know, do we see that, you know, there's a, an opportunity or a willingness uh, for airlines or customers to kind of pay more to kind of bridge that gap? Um, Hartej, I know you kind of have some thoughts around around this this issue here. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great point. Um, so from the airline perspective, just given the slim operating margins of that business, airlines are typically not willing to pay one cent more for, for fuel, right? So what are the other levers we can pull? Um, it's, it starts with the stacking of incentives. So you have the federal and state incentives that, uh, really take a sizable chunk off of that, uh, cost curve of SAF, but there's still a remaining portion. Uh, and that remaining portion after incentives is called, uh, in, in the industry, the green premium, right? Um, what folks have explored is, can we leverage corporate demand to, uh, address that green premium? And at RMI, for example, we we founded the Sustainable Aviation's Buyers Alliance um, that essentially aggregates this corporate demand. Uh, you know, the, the biggest uh, technology companies, the biggest uh, consulting firms that have high domestic travel uh, and have the willingness to pay. You know, can we aggregate that demand to address the green premium? And early on, we're seeing success in that model. Um, so there's a lot of things we can do on the demand side to help address. That that cost uh, that cost curve that we're seeing the cost disparity. I know. Yeah. Um, I, I've funny. seen buying buying an airline ticket that you have the option to pay a little bit more in order to help offset your carbon intensity and and um, uh, I I don't know exactly how the airlines are are then um, accounting for that but but I think that that's a great way to to give the opportunity to yes the fuel's a little more expensive but if if it uh, if it's worth it to somebody to pay that extra, then uh, hopefully that makes it so the airlines can keep their margins because they are really thin. Perfect. Yeah, I think I, I read somewhere that um, corporate travel is around ten uh, percent of of overall airline travel. So, so I think that presents a, a big market for you know companies like the Googles and the Amazons of the world to kind of step up and and really um, you know help pay for and cover some of those costs uh, might be a great opportunity in, in the future. Um, you know, if, if there's no other kind of thoughts around around the airline demand side, I'd love to talk a little bit on the infrastructure side. And, and maybe I see some questions flowing in on, on booking claim as well. Um, but I think to start off, um, we'd just love to hear thoughts on, you know, are, are airports ready to, uh, to take on SAP? Um, you know, do they need infrastructures uh, to be, infrastructure to be upgraded? Um, and, you know, how can they afford those, those types, those costs that are going to be incurred in order to, to bring on SAF in the near term, which, which has to be blended uh, up to up to 50%. Um, so, so Tony, any, any thoughts around, around that? Maybe we'll start with you on, on the, on the infrastructure side and, and what needs to be done there. Yeah. I mean, um, at, at least where I've specifically focused is on the ASTM 7566, because, uh, method one in that is 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 what we're addressing uh, to get our fuel um, to be compatible, and and certainly there has to be blending. I mean, there's a blend wall associated with that, and it's fifty percent. Um, so you have to have you know the 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 fuel carriers that are bringing the fuel to um, to the airport have to be in a position where they can actually go ahead and do that blending. And and of course there's regulations around blending and making sure that. That they you know um, don't exceed the blend wall and things like that, so that the fuel they deliver um, you know meets the specification. So um, I don't think there's a, a lot of infrastructure yet for that because there just isn't a lot of SAP. But that is one area that needs to grow and, and quickly if we're going to be able to address this. Yeah, the good news is is that there's no technological risk of installing tanks and blending stations. It's a modest capital cost. So there's an so yes, it's needed. It's not overwhelmingly difficult to do it. Great. Um, so you know, in in a lot of places, right, we're gonna have SAF be available in certain airports and not in others, and maybe certain regions. So 
you know, there's a lot of debate going on over over book and claim. Uh, should it be allowed? Is it needed? Um, you know, how how do we balance the need for fuel supply and infrastructure build out? So, um, any thoughts around book and claims? Um, you know, use in the SAF industry and, and how, how we can see that developing going forward? Yeah, I'm happy to take a first crack at this one, Jade. So, you know, today certification schemes for, for SAF, um, which, you know, are increasingly being considered a prerequisite for any corporate customer or uh, for any regulatory end use, uh, you know, whether it's through Corsia or some other mechanism, you know, they require physical interconnection of the whole SAP supply chain up till blending uh, on what's called like a mass balance basis. What that basically means is that there's some there's some way you could prove that the molecule could get from point A to point B, um, at least on a loose basis, right? And because we have so much jet fuel infrastructure in the US, that's typically not an issue. Um, so that's that's the sort of current state of play where the industry wants to evolve to is what you what you mentioned which is book and claim where there's no actual physical interconnection between the origin and destination but you could trade those environmental attributes uh what we need to get to that future state is uh the systems the governance the the registries uh real clear traceability of the environmental attributes of said saf molecule um, and, you know, we're working on, on building those registries here at RMI, uh, and there's a number of other groups that are working on uh, parallel efforts, uh, but that's where we, where we hope to get to in a future state. And what that would do is essentially allow um, producers like, like Tony, for example, um, to decouple, you know, where they choose to phys uh, physically locate um, and, and essentially locate closer to feedstock, right? Uh, and not be as worried about uh, being closer to the band centers. So that's that's the beauty of the book and claim system, but we're not there yet. There's there's some work to do. Awesome. Um, so I know we're we're you know coming up on the on the last 10 or 15 minutes of of our discussion. So I want to make sure we get to some more of these these questions coming in. So we'll kind of do you know some more rapid fire, kind of bounce around on some different topics that we've touched on. Um, you know, maybe Amina, this one could be a good one for you to maybe kick us off with. Um, what what can we expect from the next edition of the IRA and RFS from 2024 onwards? Um, and will we see adap uh, adaptations and improvements based on on what the industry has requested? Any thoughts around kind of those those policies going forward? Not really sure uh, what the next edition means, but um, but yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on on where those policies could be heading. So I would start with the observation that there's a lot of movement right now. I mentioned earlier, you know, EPA just, um, you know, finalized a, a new rule, which will become effective September 11th. There's new new content, you know, in that rule. As this industry is maturing, there's new fat, fact patterns, like new questions coming up that the regulator then needs to consider. Um, so I think what, just very high level one trend we'll be seeing from having a lot of questions to really having more answers and therefore more guidance and more certainty. Um, so without now saying which direction directly we'll be going, my hope would be that is, as the industry matures, also the regulations governing the industry was, will also mature and that will you know, make it easier for all the participants. So that's sort of one, one observation. Mm -hmm. um, the other one is really trying to find the, the right balance. Uh, Tony mentioned that earlier, especially if we if we look outside of the US, there's gonna be, and it's true for the US too, but it may be even more so true for outside the US. There are very many small players, right? These are, I don't know, it's a small shop and, and they have some feedstock left over, some waste product that can be utilized for SAF production. So if we now come with the US regulations <laughs> and try and apply that to these small entities, and have the producer ultimately be responsible for it, that creates certain challenges, of course. So what we'll have to, I hopefully we'll see, is sort of the, the right balance between, yes, regulating and making sure it's all, you know, good and we all, you know, trust in the product, but at the same time, you know, not foreclosing that certain types of feedstocks or certain, you know, sources can be used at all. Yeah. Um, and yeah, actually kind of bringing it back to the feedstock, um, Mark, this is a question directed directed towards you. 
Um, you know, how, how can, um, the question is, is how to create an effective system of biomass collection where the biomass market is not organized and vastly distributed across the country uh, for a reliable supply of feedstock for biofuel. So I think the question is, is, is how do we create an effective system around um, biofuel collection at, and getting it to the biorefinery? Well, it's, I mean, so it's a real challenge, right? So um, we need infrastructure and implements like we do for the corn kernel for these various feedstocks. We are incredibly efficient at harvesting corn and moving it around this country, moving it to biorefineries. Over the last decade, that similar technology uh, has been demonstrated for harvesting corn stover. And so for every feedstock or many feedstocks, uh, may require different technology to harvest and different infrastructure to move it around. And it takes money and effort to demonstrate these technologies. So there is no single, I don't, I don't know that there is a golden answer to this other than you have to work on it, right? You just got to work on it. Yeah. Um, yeah I, like, I, like I said before, either that or you, you find a way to address the, the smaller, you know, the smaller uh, waste streams, feedstocks uh, yep. at the source and not use the energy to transport them. Yeah. Yeah, and Tony, I guess um, while we have you on, um, this is sort of a question in that to you on the, um, you know, on the, on the dairy cows side, you know, we, uh, the comment was, you know, one third of dairy cows in the U.S. is, is a lot. Um, what percent are actually in freestyle operation uh, with enough critical mass to justify the cost of investment with uh, at least a 25% ROI? So very specific there. Um, I think, um, you know, at current market prices. So I think, you know, the question is, is, um, you know, what what amount of, of cattle are needed um, in, in critical mass to justify investing in a, in a renewable or I guess a SAF project or maybe renewable fuels in general? Yeah. So what we found, and I, I'm, I guess I'm not going to be able to calculate to the 25% ROI that's of interest per se, but uh, to, 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 ha to have a, a payback on the system within, let's say, five to seven years, um, we are able to go down to around 4,000 um, uh, dairy cows. Um, I think you would find that, that almost all dairy cows are already in a, um, in a barn structure that makes manure collection easy. Um, dairy cows feed all day long. Uh, they get milk three times a day. Um, their manure collection is, is a critical factor for the, the health of the animals. Um, what you do with the manure afterward, of course, is, is where we kind of come in. Um, and anaerobic digestion is, is a well-known technology that's easy to apply even at much smaller farms. Um, and you know, there's the opportunity to aggregate uh, farms that are not too far from each other, where perhaps there are only 2,000 cows. Um, the dairy industry is going bigger uh, for lots of other reasons. Um, so I would say of the 29 million uh, dairy cows in the United States, well over half of those are on large farms. And kind of a, a follow on to that, and, and this someone asked, uh, and this also is in line with some of my curiosity, but, you know, is SAF production compatible with um, things like regenerative farming or regenerative agriculture? Uh, the comment there is, is uh, manure mostly is, is kind of staying on the land or, or being used for fertilizer. So, so how do you see the, the usage of, of manure? Um, and and it's, it's also com competition for fertilizer in that source. Well, um, so we end up currently, we use just the, the biogas off the top. So that's the methane and CO2 that if you just put it in the pit, they were going to become airborne anyway. They were never going to be constituents in the ground. Um, and so we're not actually taking any of the nutrients uh, out of the manure. Um, and so the land apply uh, of the manure is identical, um, regardless of whether we do this. Um, that said, there is a lot of advantage for farmers um, because over nutrification is a problem um, and, and you know, groundwater and so forth. So if you can afford the, the digester, there can be other advantages in terms of being able to pull out nutrients and then more smartly apply them instead of over nutrifying your, um, your groundwater. Yeah, that's super helpful. So, so what you're saying is you can kind of use the energy from the, from the biogas being generated, but you still have some leftover nutrients that can be used as a, as a fertilizer. All, the, all the nutrients that would have made it to the land from land applying the manure are still there. We don't take any of them. Okay, great. Thanks for clarifying on that. 
Um, and, and Hartej, uh, over to you on this one, you know, th there's some questions around, you, you kind of brought up the, the, the need for, for hydrogen in the production process of these, uh, of sustainable aviation fuel and, and most technologies. Um, the question is, is, is the hydrogen feedstock um, required in bio-based SAF? Um, and if yes, is there a potential for green hydrogen um, sourcing? Is there a potential for green hydrogen sourcing uh, that could reduce the the life cycle analysis and overall CI of the of the SAF? Yeah, short answer is yes. Whether you're doing using the HEFA process, which is waste oils, fats, and greases, or the ATJ process, you need uh, a quite a sizable amount of hydrogen, um, and it varies based on the production technology. Um, in the market today, you know, 90% plus of SAF produce is produced via fats, oils, greases, via the HEFA technology. Um, and uh, what's traditionally, what's used today is, is gray hydrogen. So uh, hydrogen from steam methane reforming, et cetera. Um, where we really start to see game-changing reductions in, in the finished product carbon intensity is when we replace uh, that gray hydrogen with with blue and green hydrogen, uh, preferably. Um, and you know when when the green hydrogen is from behind the meter renewables and not from a a, a pretty poorly decarbonized grid, we see even even greater reductions in the finished product CI. So long story short, I think the I'll reiterate that the hydrogen feedstock and the carbon intensity associated with it is a big lever we can turn uh, to reduce the finished product CI. Awesome. Th thank you so much. And I think we might have time for, for one more question be before uh, closing remarks. Um, I think I think this is kind of a, an interesting one, maybe for you, Mark. Um, you know, you, you commented earlier on, on there being, I think, a, a large amount of corn stover. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think the question is, and this might tie into you, Tony, as well, is, is it more efficient to convert corn stover to SAF via a digester to jet route or cellulosic ethanol to jet? So should we digest it or should we uh, turn it into ethanol and use the alcohol to jet route. Any thoughts around, you know, those two technologies and, and what's more efficient? I do not have, I, I can't really comment on the efficiency of those technologies and, and the yield um, without, without doing some digging. Sorry, don't know it off the top of my head. No worries. I think that's a very, very specific question. And, and also, <laughs> yeah, great to great to hear folks are thinking about that. I mean, yeah. I think from from our end, um, you know, there, there's a company um, called Verbio that I think is looking at taking some waste uh, from from ethanol production uh, and, and using anaerobic digestion for that. So so that could be a potential um, company to kind of look into and, and how they're doing that. Um, interesting stuff there. But um, but yeah, lot, lots of great questions, lots of great discussion. Uh, we have a, a, one minute left um, and uh, would love to uh, pass it over to Harry for kind of closing remarks um, for, for a great, great discussion. Yeah, thank you so much, Jade. Uh, thank you, Tony, Amina, Mark, and uh, Hartesh. Some some really fantastic discussions there and I hope uh, it's been as insightful for, for yourselves as it has been for me. Uh, as we said, uh, yeah, thank you to everyone for, for their time today and uh, and their involvement. It's been a really fantastic discussion, some exciting developments, and it looks like a lot of emerging opportunities for both feedstocks and technologies uh, that continue to rise. As I mentioned at the start of, uh, of this discussion, this uh, webinar has been held uh, prior to Sustainable Aviation Futures, taking place in Houston on the 2nd to the 4th of October. And I'm delighted that all of the companies and organizations involved in today's webinar will be in some form participating in the event uh, to come, as well as some of the other fantastic companies that we already have on board. A reminder that this is the last week to be able to purchase the three for two passes to attend the event. So as I can show you on the next slide, it's the opportunity to, to to get a free pass to the event. So with that, if any, uh, if you need any further information regarding the event or want to speak to any of me or my colleagues, then you can see our details on screen. Uh, a final mention that this webinar has been recorded and will be shared with you. And apologies if we didn't have time to answer all of the questions. There were quite simply too many. So with that, a massive thank you uh, and have a great rest of your afternoons. And uh, yeah, hopefully see you soon. Thank you.